and welcome back. Chapter 6. On the windward coast of St. Lucia's in the town of Dennery, the white buildings of the correctional facility spread across the flat plain as hills jetted up in the distance and palm trees swayed in the ocean breeze. Sydney's crew consisted of two cameramen, a sound engineer, and a lighting, lightning tech, all of whom had piled into the van for the long journey from Sugar Beach out of the plantation and through the mountains of St. Lucia's to the island's only jail. One of the cameramen opened the sliding door of the van as they crested the hills. The correctional facility came into view in the basin below. With the camera on his shoulder, he leaned out the open door to capture the footage. Tall chain link, link fences topped with spiral barbed wires surrounded the entire complex. After the 12 foot brick interior wall and four guard towers, the chain link was the last line of defense to separate an inmate from the rest of the island. Long rectangles of two story white brick buildings, four in total, made up the cell blocks. An arid dirt soccer field represented the prisoners only relief from confinement and from their place up on the hill. Sydney and her crew witnessed two teams of felon running through the dusty haze. This was where Grace had spent the last 10 years. The scores of letters written by Grace over the years had come as Sydney climbed to some semblance of fame for her previous documentaries and the exoneration that, uh, exonerations that followed. The first letter had arrived after Sydney's documentary featuring Nev Blackmore, a middle-aged woman who spent 18 years in a Florida jail for the murder of her 10-year-old son. As a young and inexperienced producer, Sydney poked around the case until she became certain of the woman's innocence. Some great investigational journalism, along with dumb luck and the discovery of a scathing piece of DNA evidence, had been enough for Florida's newly elected state attorney to reopen the case. Nearly two decades after her son was savaged, Nev Blackmore was exonerated. Sydney's documented Mrs. Blackmore's journey. The unearthing of new evidence and Nev's eventually released from jail and put it all together in a two-hour film. Although the first documentary was held as a symbol of justice, Sydney looked at it as just the opposite. In the wake of her son's death, a mother was accused of his murder and forced to mourn in prison. Nev Blackmore fought for most of her adult life to clear her name. Yes, she was ultimately vindicated, but she had paid a hell of a price for the mistakes of those too eager to convict. And 18, and 18 agonizing years later, still no one had been held accountable for her son's murder. Nev Blackmore had spent nearly two decades not tracking down her son's killer, but simply working to prove her innocence. It seemed to Sydney much less an image of justice than a pitiful waste of two lives. When that first documentary gained critical praise and a moderate audience, letters trickled in from inmates around the country hoping for Sydney to conjure the same magic that she had freed Nev Blackmore. Sydney paged through each letter, researching the convictions and the evidence that produced them. Back then, the mail was manageable. She handled every envelope herself and settled on the case of Brian, Byron Williams, a young African-American man accused of shooting and killing two plainclothes police officers who were on surveillance, surveillance duty. With alibis from five different sources and forensics that suggested the shooter to be female, Sydney attacked the case with zeal. With her camera crew in tow, she led a year-long investigation that finally caught the attention of the U.S. Senator and the local district attorney. This time, after eight years in prison, Brian Williams was released and cleared of all charges. 
Sydney organized her journey into a four-part documentary and shopped it around. Netflix purchased it, created an aggressive marketing plan, and released it to some subscribers to be streamed over the internet. It became the most downloaded true crime documentary of the year, putting Sidney Ryan's name on the radar of every convict in the country who believed he or she was innocent. Her inbox flooded with requests from felons requesting her assistance with their appeals. Family members of the accused also penned letters, begging Sidney to help their loved ones who rotted in jail for crimes they didn't commit. In a given week, she'd receive a stack of envelopes six inches thick. Inside the packages were shoddy investigational work, list of appeals, and makeshift interviews with witnesses that would surely crack each case. The mail became too much to handle and much of it sadly piled up, unopened and ignored in the corner of her office. Suddenly, a sought after producer and filmmaker, she fielded a host of offers before finally taking a producing spot on the primetime show events, which was tied to the popular magazine at the same, of the same name. There she began work on her third documentary, entering into the ruthless world of television network hierarchy. hierarchy. Sydney was naive to the backstabbing and conniving that dominated the industry and had been eaten alive and overshadowed by Luke Barrington during her first year as his producer. Still, Sydney's style and strong filmmaking skills won many accolades and spawned many lookalikes, including podcasts and YouTube documentaries of little known crimes. It was about that time that she opened the first letter from Grace. Sydney knew the case well, and not simply because she and Grace had attended Syracuse University together. The story had made national headlines a decade earlier and the American media went frenzy, were frenzy about the sordid details. Gruesome Grace of Bold and Grizzly Grace were the chosen headlines of the day used to describe the fourth year medical student who had blundered her boyfriend before pushing him off a cliff in the Caribbean. Although they never ran in the same circles, Sydney remembered Grace well enough at the time the news broke, four or five years after Syracuse, to be shocked by the story. Sydney didn't, however, have a good enough connection with her to know if the accusations were true or false. A decade later, Sydney was getting the opportunity to find out. She spent hours reading the more than 100 letters Grace had sent over 26 month span. Sydney noted as she carefully paged through each of them that none was rep repetitive. Other than asking for Sydney help at the end, each letter tackled a different subject. Many were powerful estimations about the inconsistencies in the case against her, the rules of good investigational work that were violated, the physical evidence that was engineered, the DNA findings that were misinterpreted, the complete lack of motivation for Grace to have killed the man she loved. Others were about Grace's life before the conviction, the family that desperately grieved for her, the brother who was ill and required more care than her parents could offer and the life she was missing as the years passed by in jail. Some were nothing more than congratulations on Sydney's success and her rise in the ranks of television journalism, praising her hard work and the difference she made in the lives of those she helped exonerate. Through the letters, Sydney felt a sense of charisma emanating from Grace, a trait she could neither explain nor remember from her time with Grace at Sarah Cruz. There was something alluring about Grace, and if Sydney could sense it through the letters, she was certain viewers would see it in a documentary. Grace's attorney had provided Sydney with a thumb drive of all the relevant information about the case. 
from Julius Chris autopsies report and photos to toxicology's findings to evidence collected during the investigation to high risk crime screen photos to recorded interviews and court transcripts. Sydney knew everything about Grace's case, her trial and her conviction. At least this was her belief before interviewing Claude Pierre. Okay, that's the end of chapter six. Hmm. Wow. Okay, I don't have any, that much to say about it. It's just that Grace has been writing to her ever since, um, ever since she was convicted. Wow, and that's was what did they say? Eight years? Ten years? And she's she convinced that she's she's not guilty. Okay, well. The information and evidence is still building. What y'all think so far? That's all I got. I don't have too much of anything to say about it because like I said, it's still building. All right, so I shall see y'all in the next chapter. Bye.